so this is there's no such thing as a one size fits all diet. However, there are some diets that are going to be universally unhealthy, and there's going to be some diets which are going to be universally healthy. But they're at extremes, and the question is, whereabouts on that do you need to go the extreme low carb diet, high fats, on and so forth, or can you be a bit more relaxed and still get the results you need? And when I say it's no one size fits all, it's on a continuum. So if I've got an athlete, they might be able to have 100 grams of carbohydrates a day, which is a reasonable amount, and still be in perfectly good health. Whereas somebody else who's extremely insulin resistant, they've been metabolically damaged over decades, they can probably look at a donut from across the road and have an insulin spike. So my favorite tool for that is a continuous glucose monitor, which is a little device. It's about the size of a 20 cent piece. It just sticks onto the back of your arm and it communicates wirelessly with your phone and you get real-time readouts on what your sugar response is to the foods that you're consuming. And this is absolutely fabulous. So some people come in and say, well, can I eat this particular food? And I'll say, well, how many grams of it? How rapidly is it going to be at the start of a meal or at the end of a meal? Because that affects how things are digested as well. So the only way to know whether you can consume a particular food in a particular amount at a particular time for your personal metabolism is to actually assess whether it's causing a spike in your blood sugar level. And we know that if you're getting a spike in your blood sugar level, then that's a reasonable surrogate marker to say, well, you're probably going to be getting insulin spiking and some deleterious effects going on. So the question is how many carbs can I consume? It has to be answered by personal experimentation. And we're fortunate now that we've got these beautiful devices, the continuous glucose monitors. You don't have to wear one continuously. Like just You get one, wear it for 10 days or 14 days, but depending on the country you're in, they have different durations. And use it and learn from it. If you see particular food spike your sugar levels, you should not consume that food or at least, you know, be mindful of what it's doing to you when you consume that food. And if you're seeing that you can consume, you know, bacon and eggs for breakfast and your sugar level stays perfectly level, then that's absolutely fine. Now, just a couple of words of caution on the continuous glucose monitor. They don't measure the concentration of sugar in your blood the way the finger prick glucose does. They don't actually sit inside your blood vessels. They sit in the fluid around the blood vessels. It's called the interstitial fluid. And so basically the sugar level in that fluid reaches an equilibrium with the sugar concentration going through the blood vessels over about five minutes or more. So it, it just delay behind a, a finger prick glucose measure. But also because it, it doesn't measure the concentration, it measures the amount of sugar being delivered to the fluid around the blood vessels, it's affected by blood flow. So what does that mean? So if you increase your circulation, say if you're exercising or if you go and have a a hot shower or a sauna, then the blood flow around the sense is going to increase. So the delivery of sugar to the sensor is going to increase. I often have patients come to me and say, oh my goodness, I'm worried about exercising. Every time I exercise, my sugar level spikes up through the roof. It's absolutely crazy. And it's like, well, that's actually a bit of a spurious finding. The delivery of sugar to the meter has increased, but your sugar level almost certainly didn't. And if you cross-reference that with a finger prick, you'd see the truth. So just be mindful. There are certain things about it. And in terms of the absolute level of it, It's simply not as accurate as a finger prick. But that doesn't really matter because we're not really worried about the absolute level. We're worried about avoiding the spikes that occur with the diet. So it's very similar to as a doctor when we were learning about ECGs, there's uh, something called a T wave. And if you've got too much potassium, that can affect um, the shape of the T wave. And we were taught if it looks like you wouldn't want to sit on it, as in if it looks like a spike, then it's probably pathological. And I think we can probably say the same thing about glucose spiking on a continuous glucose trace 